has been brought to you by the letter E. Hey everyone, it's good to be back. If I'm looking or sounding a little raggedy around the edges, I have been down with the flu for two weeks. So this is me recovering. Apologies for any discomfort on your ears or eyes. All right, so today we are doing E, and E is for one of my favorite subjects to talk about, ethnoarchaeology. So what is ethnoarchaeology? The book definition, and this is literally from the book, that's Renfrew and Bond, one of the most popular archaeology textbooks. Anyway, the book definition of ethnoarchaeology is the study of contemporary societies with a view towards understanding the behavioral relationships which underlie the past material record. All right, let me translate what that means. So as we already know from A is for archaeology, archaeology is the study of the human past through the material record. So what that means on a day-to-day -day basis is archaeology is kind of like being a historical detective. And I mentioned, my dear Watson. You go to some place, you find all this stuff, and you say, what was going on here? Who did this? What were they doing? What does it all mean? And the trouble with that is from the material record, which are our clues, oftentimes it's totally puzzling, the answer to all those questions, or maybe there's multiple possible explanations, and there just isn't enough evidence to really come down with a firm interpretation. So there's a few different ways to test our hypotheses or actually generate new ones. One of my favorites is another E term, which is experimental archaeology. Now, I love that, so we're definitely going to be doing that with our next E as we run through the alphabet again. But for now, let's stick to ethnoarchaeology. So what ethnoarchaeology involves is going to some far-flung corner of the, the world to directly observe a, a present-day culture, or more likely going to the library and reading uh, anthropological reports about some you know extant community at some time recently and it's trying to see how what they did uh created a material record and then comparing that to our little archaeological mystery to see if we can find a match or a good comparison now i know that's very abstract so let me make it clearer through some concrete examples first off lewis binford who i discussed in a previous episode he did some experimental archaeology with the Nanamuit tribe in Alaska. Now, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. He was studying some Paleolithic sites in France and trying to make sense of what he was finding in the material record. So he went to the Nanamuit, who are, were essentially a hunter-gatherer people at this time, uh, between 1969 and 1973. That's right after ethnoarchaeology became really popular in the 50s and 60s. And what he did was he traveled with them as they hunted to these sort of like campsites where they would take their kills, I'm guessing seals, but it could be also bear or moose or some other things that live up in the, in the Arctic or in, in Alaska. And they would process the carcasses of those things in these spots. So they'd sharpen tools and they'd you know, strip the meat off the bone and they'd carve the bone and they'd d deposit stuff. So Binford, in observing their activity, identified toss zones, drop zones, different spatial organization of the camps um, and was able to sort of record what these guys were doing. So using the insights of where different sizes and types of debris were deposited, Binford interpreted the site of Pensevon, a 15,000 year old Paleolithic site in France. And this site was actually originally excavated by uh, André Leroy Gorin, who we discussed in the C for Chien Opératoire episode, because he was the guy who came up with Chien Opératoire. Now, anyway, what Binford did was comparing the debris patterns with what he saw in Alaska. He interpreted the site um, as being, I think, involving some tent-like structures, and there were several hearths. He identified um, a site, I believe, where the hunter sat and sort of processed the kills. So he was able to, using the ethno-archaeological comparison with a present-day contemporary culture, he was able to figure out, or at least claim he figured out 
what was going on in this, this old site in Pensvon. Now, there's lots of other fun examples. From my studies, I look at early medieval Britain in particular. And at that time, um, the buildings didn't really survive because they were all made of wood. So when you look for buildings from that period nowadays, all you see are kind of stains in the grounds. So you learn a lot more from burials. That's our main window into this past society because there's not buildings left or very few, and there's very, very little writing left from that time. Now, in the 1970s, Ian Hodder, who I've also discussed previously, wanted to take on this relatively simplistic notion that the stuff, the burial goods that someone is buried with, is a reflection of their social rank, how wealthy and powerful they are. And at a certain level, that makes a lot of sense. Um, oftentimes the burials that we find that are very lavish with carvings and riches are the burials of pharaohs and kings. However, the idea that there's a direct relationship between how elaborate a burial is and how highly ranked that person was in society, that's not necessarily a direct relationship. Um, so what Ian Hodder did to sort of criticize this simplistic view was he looked at funerary practices among the Nuba in Sudan and the Romas, also commonly known as gypsies in Britain. And what he showed is that the funerary practices of those peoples really reflected more about the society's view towards death and other spiritual matters, as opposed to the status of the deceased. In ancient times, man was ignorant as to the cause and nature of death. So, Death was greeted with a certain degree of awe. Oh. Oh. But because man did not have the time for complicated rituals, funeral services were often brief. Now, thinking about also contemporary societies nowadays, um, in a lot of uh, different um, contexts like Judaism, like Islam, you know, uh, funerals are relatively austere practices. In Judaism, what you do for a dead person, your grave good is you put a stone on their tomb. So even from contemporary religions, if you think someone's going to dig us up in the future, this idea, that which seems obvious that lavish burials mean rich and powerful person, not necessarily true. If you think about Tibetan sky burials, basically what they do is hack someone up and leave them for the birds. So how much are you really going to be able to tell by what's left of the people? Not that much. So Ian Hodder deconstructed this using ethno-archaeological observations. Another somewhat morbid example surrounds cave paintings, which we've discussed previously in the Koske Mediterranean and some of the archaeology news segments. Now, if you remember cave paintings, uh, a lot of these are like 30 or 40,000 years old, and they depict like stenciled hands. Somebody traced their hands, and that's the painting on the wall of the cave. And a lot of these seem to be missing digits. Now, there was a team uh, out of Australia who essentially interpreted this as a kind of a sign language. So this also, using ethno-archaeological observations of current or recent uh, hunter societies, when people are hunting, they have to be very quiet. And so a lot of them develop a kind of sign language. And there's even some thought that that was sort of an earl the earliest form of language before articulated words. But in any event, they are positing, using different ethno-archaeological examples, that the different hands and with missing digits on these cave paintings are actually just depictions of their sign language. And they even depict, uh, considered that some of what they found was a sort of hunting calendar, um, which talked about the behaviors of different kinds of animals at different parts of the year. So they even claimed to have interpreted some of this, and that would make it by far the earliest uh, example of, of writing in human history. However, um, the interpretation from another study claims, and this is pretty gruesome, that um, those missing digits actually are missing and that some of these folks ritualistically removed their finger digits. Um, now, again, that sounds crazy, 
but they found something like a hundred ethno-archaeological examples, comparisons of societies in which people do this, remove digits for non-medical reasons. For example, the death of a child. Now, I know what you're thinking. That sounds really like a stupid thing to do for people who have to hunt. But there's explanations for that. Perhaps the people who were doing the hand painting were not the people doing the hunting. Or even imagine something, and I don't know if they have uh, an ethno-archaeological uh, example for this, but uh, it's possible. Imagine people who, like, they're so good at hunting, they're like, look at how good I am. I'm going to chop off a finger and I can still hunt. Whatever, I do what I want. And that shows how special they were. So it was like a status thing. Or imagine if some societies had enough of a surplus, they had become good enough at hunting. Well, the powerful people or the rich, relatively rich people, maybe they don't even need to hunt. So if you're removing a finger, you're like, hey, I don't even need to do work. So there are examples and there's so many societies and cultures on this planet that they find some pretty far out things. Now, this actually kind of highlights one of the weaknesses uh, of ethnoarchaeology. And these two examples, one that people removed their digits, the other that it's a sign language is, you know, it provides analogies, but you can often find multiple analogies that work. And it's, you know, they're often not a perfect match and it's often difficult to determine which one is actually the right answer. Also, as this technique is typically used to interpret really the oldest and most obscure sites where there's no written evidence or even complex artistical representations to, to interpret what's going on, the ethno-archaeologists need to look for usually very, you know, um, very rustic hunter-gatherer societies. And as we know, these are becoming more and more rare uh, in today's modern world. Now, there are some of them, like deep in the Amazon or in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands in India. But for ethical reasons, you cannot contact those, they're called non-contacted or uncontacted societies. You're not allowed to bother those people. So, Often what has, happens is um, archaeologists look for old ethnographic uh, and ethnological reports. Now, a lot of those are done with varying degrees of rigor, so they're not as rigorous if it's old as they would be today. And of course, a lot of those people who were being studied, either their li livelihoods and lifestyles have changed or they no longer really exist as a people. In any event, they're not really there to ask them why they did things to directly observe. So they're typically looking at older studies, which might make the comparison a little bit difficult. However, with AI and digitalization, it should become easier to do this kind of research to pull the right kinds of comparisons in the future. And, um, you know, this is really fascinating research that produces often surprising and controversial uh, results. So that is ethnoarchaeology, E for ethnoarchaeology. Hey, if you like what you heard, give me that thumbs up below, hit that bell to subscribe, or if you want to support more independent archaeology content, consider contributing to my Patreon, where you can enjoy some exclusive members-only benefits and other goodies. Until the next dig.